This is Shuttle Launch Control, T minus three hours and holding. Here's our commander, Chris Ferguson. He's in the suit up room. He's uh, having a fit check of his helmet. He's our commander on this flight and uh, going over to pilot Doug Hurley. This is his second trip into space. He completed his first space flight on STS-127, and he's logged more than 376 hours in space. And here is mission specialist number one, Sandy Magnus. This is her third space flight. She spent more than four months in space aboard the International Space Station. She flew on uh, STS-112, logged uh, 11 days in space, and then uh, four and a half months after uh, being on board the space station as a member of the Expedition uh, uh, 18 crew. This is Rex Walheim. He's our mission specialist number two. He's making his third space flight. He spent more than 24 days in space on STS-110 and STS-122, and he's had five spacewalks totaling more than 36 hours. And uh, he's served very effectively as the chief of the EVA branch. So the crew now is uh, finishing their suit-up activities, and they are scheduled to leave for the launch pad in just about 25 minutes. And here they come. Crew going down the elevator where they'll be greeted by employees from Kennedy Space Center and members of the news media. This is the same elevator that's been used by the astronauts ever since Apollo. And there they go, escorted by NASA security. Also be a helicopter flying overhead.
It's about a 20 minute ride out to launch pad 39A. This is shuttle launch control, T minus two hours, 31 minutes, five seconds and counting. The flight crew is now in the white room of the orbiter access arm. Members of the closeout crew are in the white coveralls and the astronauts, of course, are in the orange pressure suits. The uh, closeout crew will be assisting the astronauts with their helmets and other equipment as they enter the orbiter. This is an incredibly experienced and dedicated team that gets the people on the orbiter, and Travis is in charge of the whole thing. And not only is he in charge of this one, but he's in charge of the whole, uh, whole closeout crew. We can see here Chris Ferguson getting put into a seat. And the folks that are helping him get in his seat there are uh, n the number two. If you can see the number two on him is Randy Brezhnik. He's actually uh, a Marine, uh, Marine Corps colonel. He's one of our astronauts. You can see him in the one screen. And uh, Randy is actually getting on there to help out with the communications checks and all those kind of things. But the guy running the operation is um, Drew Billingsley, who's number three. Um, and you can see him kind of climbing all over there. If you look in the view there, you can see Chris Ferguson right in front of us and uh, kind of behind uh, to the right, kind of leaning over is Randy Brezhnik, number two, and now disappeared from sight is Drew Billingsley. He's called the flight deck crew insertion technician, the one that gets him on the upstairs. Born in Santa Monica, California, and grew up in Huntington Beach. Uh, served in the U.S. Army. He's been in this role for a long time. Uh, he was initial uh, suit tech in STS-86 back in 1997. What they're doing as they go through here is, uh, as Chris gets in the seat, there's probably about nine different connections that need to be made, both uh, to the vehicle itself as well as uh, within his own gear there. And as you can see, we're pretty much, uh, as astronauts, just hanging back and letting them do it. The best thing we can do is let these professionals do their job. So you can see Chris is just concentrating on getting his hands out of the way and making sure that Drew has access to uh, what he's working over on the right there is his liquid cooling. Uh, you've got all the straps that have to come around. There's a, it's a five-strap harness. You have to get the uh, parachute, which is what you're seeing there. Randy has the close one, and uh, Drew has the far one. you got the parachute straps that are waiting for you. The parachute's already in the seat when you get in. They put those over the side, and they connect those in. You'll see a real good shot of that right here. You'll see them connected in to the, um, to the uh, straps that Chris is already into that he came in with his, um, his chest strap and everything. So that gets connected there. And they're essentially doing all these connections to make sure he's nice and... Uh, Nice and snug in there and all ready to go. So you're talking about the two guys in there. Drew, is uh, this is be his 11th mission. I'm trying to remember Randy. And this is Randy's first one is the number two. So this is the first time he's actually inside the vehicle doing this, this, uh, this setup here. So I'm sure he's having a lot of fun. And this looks like uh, Doug Hurley. Yes, it would be Doug Hurley uh, going in, Marine uh, Colonel. He is... Uh, fine as the pilot on this flight. This is his second flight. Flew a few years ago on 127. Uh, and he's being helped there. You can see the guys out in the white room. They get everybody ready to go. Number four there is Rene Arians. He's another longtime member. And by the way, all the guys that we've talked about so far are USA employees, uh, other than Randy Brezhnik, of course, who's the astronaut. But Rene has been with the United Space Alliance for a long time. 27 years in the space program. He's been for 40 launches. Uh, and he's, uh, he's just doing a great job for us. He's a uh, been the OVCC. He's actually had Travis Thompson's job. Travis is number one. Um, there's only a, about three or four people that are qualified to do that job at any one time. And Renee is another one. But in this flight, he's actually filling the number four role. And so um, he does a great job with it. He's going to be the hatch technician when they close the hatch and take care of all that stuff. I mentioned Randy Bressing. He's the ASP, right? Astronaut support yep, it's person. called astronaut support person, yeah. When, when does he get on board? He, he gets on fairly early, doesn't he? He does. He comes out and gets everything prepared inside the crew cockpit before the crew gets out there and makes sure that all their gear is in place. There's a lot of things they don't bring with them. They don't carry out with them that we take out for them. And I did this job uh, quite a while ago, and um, there's a lot of things you take out there, get ready. You, you essentially triple check the cockpit to make sure everything's in place. You can see Drew there working with uh, Chris uh, Fergie's uh, communication gear, that's the white line that's coming down. It's actually from the back of the helmet that connects into the system, but that's uh, the line that communication comes through. So you see that wraps around a, a couple times. And the black piece of gear we call the hot dog there, that's the quick disconnect. Everything that he's being strapped into the shuttle with has a quick disconnect so they can just pull things instead of having to tightly undo things. Everything just has a quick pull that they can take apart in case they would have to get out. If there's some kind of emergency at the pad and instead of launching, they're going to have to get out. There's a bunch of quick disconnects she pulls so they can just, for Chris, he would roll to his right, drop down on the MS-2 seat, which uh, Drew 
or uh, not Drew, but uh, Randy Bresnik is kind of on over there on the left. He would drop down on the seat down there and then get out of the vehicle. So uh, that's part of the reason why it takes so long is because everything's an intricate thing. You don't want anything to be tangled up. You don't want anything that can slow the crew member down if they need to get out of the vehicle. So. And this is Sandy Magnus. She's our mission specialist number one. So when she gets in, I think um, she's going to be on the flight deck in the aft right okay. seat. Um, step 628. That's correct. We've got a good view of it now. Uh, they are complete and Doug has gotten in from the mid deck, and you kind of have to go in through the mid deck, through the hatch, and in the mid deck, you kind of take a right, about a 90 degree right. You have to go through the ladder access, which normally when you're vertical, you'd be climbing the ladder. In this case, you're going right, and then you actually crawl on the aft panels, and you can see that Randy's actually standing on the aft panels there as he gets folks ready to get in, in the vehicle. So we've got uh, things down there that protect the aft panels, a uh, certain place where you can stand. Like if you notice, for instance, Randy's not standing on the switches. We can't stand there. But it's kind of intricate. You have to weave your way around. And so you come in the hatch, you turn to your right for about 90 degrees, go about five feet, you drop down to the aft panels, aft lower panels of the flight deck, and then you climb up on the Mission Specialist 2 seat, and then you have to get yourself up in the pilot or commander seat. So these are the hardest two seats to get into, and it's kind of a monkey bar thing. There's a, a grip up there that they grab with their hands, and then they put their feet up there, and oftentimes you'll see the, the technicians, either Drew or Randy, helping them get their feet up there and get all situated. And then the critical thing is, is getting yourself on the, the parachute correctly. You want to get yourself all the way down in the seat as far as to the seat pan as you can because the shoulder straps of the parachute can be quite uh, uh, painful if you don't get a little bit those a little bit loose. So you want to make sure you're as far down in the seat pan as possible. So you see a lot of adjustments here uh, where they're pushing on them and pulling on people and getting them in the right place. And it's kind of a manhandling task. Obviously with the suit, the suit weighs a lot. It usually weighs about 50 to 60 pounds, and so they're carrying a lot of extra weight, and it's bulky, and it's it's hard to get where you want to go. And that's why we have so much extra help in there for these guys. It, this job is almost impossible to do yourself on the ground. On orbit, it's pretty easy. Uh, you just have to set things up, and you're floating, so it's a lot easier. You can move around a lot more readily, uh, and the bulkiness doesn't hurt you near, nearly as much when you're in zero-G. CMT and MIT adjustment is complete. Ready for IMU platform positioning. Copy that. Next milestone is a check of the orbiter's flight controls. TLS is go for perch sequence four. And there will be a steering check of Atlantis's three main engines. find now that the main engines are in their start position. TLS is go for ET LO2 pressurization. We're starting now the retraction of the gaseous oxygen vent arm, the vent hood. OTC, clear caution warning memory, verify no unexpected errors. Fuel cells going to internal, external tank camera being activated at this time. OTC, PLT, no unexpected errors. Copy that. Flight crew OTC, close and lock your visors and initiate O2 flow. That's it, work. T minus two minutes. Yellow is go for ET LH2 pressurization. Solid rocket booster camera is being activated.
T-minus. Sound suppression water system is being armed. T-minus one minute. But oxygen and liquid hydrogen fill in drain valves are closed. T-minus 40 seconds, handing off to Atlantis' computers at T-minus 31. T-minus 35, 33, Hold at T minus 31 seconds due to a failure. And we have had a failure. Grand lot sequencer. We have a problem on the Gox retract switches. And NTDSP. Go ahead. Yes, sir, we need uh, guys to go do the, the verification per the LCC, please. All right, CMAC. Yes, CMAC. The LCC says we need to verify using a camera, and we're positioning camera 62 right now. Okay, let us know as soon as 62 is swung over and you can verify LCC for GVA retract, please. And all personnel we're holding here at 31 seconds while we get a verification that the GVA has fully retracted for our pre-plan. This is CMEC, we verify uh, retracted. Okay, and you can verify that it is fully retracted per the, uh, the instructions that we've been, uh, that we developed, correct? That's correct. All right, and STE? And NTD, STE concurs. They satisfy the requirements of GSC 13 pre plan contingency. I'm go. Okay, I copy. And launch director. Yes, sir, I heard all that and concur. Press on. All right, very good. NTD, ST. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I need concurrence to GLS and mass to clear the hold, please. Very good. And GLS, you have concurrence. Go. Copy that. It's in work. Thank you. Let us know when that's complete. Entity, we have it in work. All right, guidance. And just a reminder for folks, our uh, lock turn back hold time is 3 minutes and 16 seconds. TDC, TLS on 212, we're ready to go. All right, very good. And launch director, with that cleanup, we're going to go ahead and proceed. Yes, sir, please do. All right, and all personnel, we are going to pick up the clock here momentarily. And GLS, you can resume the clock on your mark. I copy that. Countdown clock will resume on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. He might have... Go sequence start. Hand off to Atlantis' computers has occurred. Solid rocket booster nozzle steering check and work. 20. Firing chain is armed. 15. Go for main engine start. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. All three engines up and burning. 2, 1, Zero and lift off the final lift off of Atlantis on the shoulders of the space shuttle. America will continue the dream. Roger roll, Atlantis. Houston now controlling the flight of Atlantis. The space shuttle spreads its wings one final time for the start of a sentimental journey into history. 24 seconds into the flight. Roll program complete. Atlantis now heads down, wings level on the proper alignment for its eight and a half minute ride to orbit. Four and a half million pounds of hardware and humans taking aim on the International Space Station. 40 seconds into the flight, the three liquid fuel main engines throttling back to 72% of rated performance in the bucket, reducing stress on the shuttle as it goes transonic for the final time. Engines now revving up, standing by for the throttle up call.
Atlantis, go at throttle up, no action, DP, DT. Go at throttle up, no action on DP, DT. That call from Capcom Barry Wilmore, a transducer, instrumentation only, no action required. Atlantis now 15 miles in altitude, already 16 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, one minute, 40 seconds into the flight. Atlantis flexing its muscles one final time. Atlantis traveling almost 2,600 miles an hour, 21 miles in altitude, 24 miles downrange, standing by for solid rocket booster separation. Booster officer confirms staging a good solid rocket booster separation. Guidance now converging. The main engine steering the shuttle on a pinpoint path to its preliminary orbit. Two minutes, 20 seconds into the flight. Atlantis already traveling 3,200 miles an hour, 35 miles in altitude, 50 miles downrange. The propulsion officer reports the orbital maneuvering system engines have ignited. Atlantis kicking on its afterburners for one minute, 23 seconds for the final phase of powered flight. Atlantis, two engine towel. Two engine towel. That and call from Capcom. Single pane day, so the, in the event of contingency, you're in plane plus 230 on the ECAL page. No com VIs when you're ready to copy. Okay, in plane plus 230, go ahead. Press to ATO, 10 decimal 8. Press to MECO, 14 decimal 7. Press ATO, 10 decimal 8, press to MECO, 14 decimal 7. That's a good read back, Atlantis. Because of the slightly late launch time, Capcom Barry Wilmore reading up to pilot Doug Hurley the updated abort boundaries for Atlantis, which is flying on the singular power of its three liquid fuel main engines, draining a half a ton of fuel per second from the shuttle's large fuel tank. Three and a half minutes into the flight, Atlantis traveling 4,200 miles an hour, 54 miles in altitude, already 120 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center. Three good main engines, three good auxiliary power units, three good fuel cells for Atlantis. Atlantis, negative return. Negative return. That call from Capcom Barry Wilmore indicating that we're too high in altitude, too far downrange to return to the launch site in the event of an engine failure. However, Atlantis's three engines performing perfectly. Four minutes, 20 seconds into the flight. Atlantis currently traveling 5,500 miles an hour, 62 miles in altitude, almost 200 miles downrange. Four minutes of powered flight remaining. Atlantis speeding straight as an arrow toward its date with the International Space Station Sunday morning. Coming up on the five minute mark. Atlantis now traveling 6,500 miles an hour, 66 miles in altitude, 250 miles downrange. Atlantis, press to ATO. Press to ATO. That call indicating we can make minimal orbital targets in the event of an engine failure. All three engines continue to function normally. Atlantis will begin its slow roll to a heads up position shortly. Five and a half minutes into the flight. Atlantis traveling 7,700 miles an hour, 315 miles downrange. Atlantis, single engine, Ops 3. Single engine, Ops 3. And the guidance officer here in Mission Control confirms that the computers are commanding the main engines to swivel. Single engine Zaragoza 104. Single engine Zaragoza 104. 
We've rolled to a heads up position now, providing better communications to the tracking and data relay satellite system as Atlantis heads uphill. Six minutes, 20 seconds into the flight. Atlantis press to Miko. Press to Miko. That call indicates that we can make our normal orbital cutoff targets in the event of an engine failure. However, all three main engines continue to function normally. Nominal. Fergie, go the plus X, go the pitch. Nominal set down plan, go for the plus X, go for the pitch. That call indicating uh, that we will be in good shape uh, for the uh, orientation of Atlantis for external tank uh, photography following main engine cutoff. Now seven minutes into the flight. One minute, 20 seconds till main engine cutoff. Atlantis traveling 12,000 miles an hour. The main engines will uh, soon be throttling down once again to limit the stress on the shuttle and its four crew members to that of three times the effective gravity. Atlantis currently traveling at a speed of more than four miles a second. One minute of powered flight remaining for Atlantis. Three good main engines, three good auxiliary power units, three good fuel cells. Approaching the eight minute mark into the flight. Atlantis now traveling more than 15,000 miles an hour. Eight minutes, 15 seconds into the flight, standing by for main engine cutoff. That'll be followed a few seconds later by the separation of the external fuel tank. Booster officer confirms main engine cutoff. For the last time, the space shuttle's main engines have fallen silent as the shuttle slips into the final chapter of a storied 30-year adventure. Now standing by for external tank separation. Atlantis off the tank. Commander Chris Ferguson will be maneuvering Atlantis now into an orientation to enable Sandy Magnus to capture digital still imagery of the external fuel tank as it drifts away. Ohms 1 is not required. Your preliminary Ohms 2 TIG, 37 minutes. 37 minutes, uh, no ohms one required, thanks.